Before I begin, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to break the bread of life together. We ask for clarity of thought, so we need you to help us remove distractions. We give you permission through the power of your Holy Spirit to move us, to see clearly with 2020 vision how we as a church can be a movement in 2020, a movement again. So may these words be your words. Please guide and direct each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Connection is very important. Not too long ago, I was done for the day, ready for bed, had an important event in the morning, and needed my phone charged. So I plugged it in, ready to go to charge all night long. I awaken in the morning, and maybe you've had this happen. Oh no, what's wrong with my phone? It hadn't charged, and now I wouldn't have hardly any charge for my important day. And what had happened? I, I worried. Did my phone finally break? Was there something wrong? More than I could afford? And after cross-checking, I finally realized that the power cord I had plugged into and the power brick was not plugged into the wall. It was not connected. You see, maybe you've had this happen to you. It's frustrating. And it teaches us the lesson that connection is important, very important. Most things cease functioning when they lose connection. When something isn't working, we should first see if everything is connected. In fact, it's often the first thing that the customer support person will ask you when you call for repair. So you're on the phone, you're telling them you've got this situation, it's a brand new item, what's wrong, it must be broken, come send somebody to fix it, and they say, please calm down. Okay, now, do you know where the in the rear end of your devices? Can you, can you move your refrigerator out of the way? Can you look behind your computer? Look in the rear of the device. Is it plugged in? They want to confirm that the power cord is plugged in. You see, when we're using your sewing machine, some of you that sew, and you're sewing along and your machine is running, and you find that the thread is no longer stitching into the fabric, the first thing you do is look and whether the needle is connected to the fabric. Is it making connection? You know when your TV remote stops working right after you've dropped it? I know you've done that one too many times. Well, you've got it down now. The first thing you do is look inside the battery compartment to see if the batteries are connected. When you pick up your landline phone to make a phone call, and you hear no dial tone, those of you who know what a landline is or remember what they are, what do you do? You look to see if the cords are connected. When you get ready to walk your dog or cat, yeah, I know, some people walk their cats, what do you do? You check to see if the leash is connected. When you get in the car, you look back to see if your kids' seatbelts are connected and, and you check yours as well. Good connection is essential, even for the church. If we aren't reaching our goals and objectives as a church, if things aren't going well, we need to see if we have lost connection. As a church, if we aren't achieving our vision and mission, we should look to see if we have lost connection to something, something essential, because connection is essential even for the church. Now first, you may be asking, what is the vision and mission of Temple City Church? Well, we're working that out. We are unveiling our journey as a leadership team in remodeling the church, so to speak. Reworking things, so to speak. This series is laying all this out. And we will give all of you a time to ask questions, participate in the process, and ultimately vote on the whole package. In the meantime, our leadership, the board, is already operating by following our vision and mission. We arrived here after hours of strategy and prayer sessions. 
the first sermon in this series, shared the vision. And so here it is again. Our vision is we see the Temple City SDA Church full and vibrant, young, sponsoring missions globally and locally with ministries like child care, arts, and a seat on the city council, a church involved in the lives of the community, sensing their pain and bringing them solutions, a blue zone, you know, like Loma Linda, the first place the community goes to for help with the city of Temple City becoming part of our community. You see, this is a wonderful vision. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a church that sees the future like this, that endeavors, that prays to see our church become this? It's our vision. And the second sermon last week covered mission, which entails sharing the good news which brings salvation to all those who believe. And so we ask, how does this mission to preach the gospel apply to Temple City specifically? So here's our mission statement. The Temple City Adventist Church exists to preach the gospel of Jesus, creating a multi-generational impact in the San Gabriel Valley. So this is the story we tell. That's the gospel. The story we preach is the good news, the gospel of Jesus, salvation through faith and grace. We pray it makes an impact on everyone multi-generationally in the San Gabriel Valley. Now, sure, we'd love to see people in other countries connect with Jesus, but we are stating that we are making it our mission to focus on people right here in our backyards, across the street, down the hall. Now, that being said, don't you think we're going to have an impossible time making our vision and mission a reality if we can't make connection with the community? Of course. So we've identified our main goals or objectives to be able to make our vision and mission a reality. Our thematic goal is to create, implement, and hold accountable connection, member to member and member to community. Now let me just mention this. Of course, our connection with Christ needs to be intact and the foundation of what we do. In fact, we just finished a sermon series that makes that case. The unstoppable church is unstoppable with Jesus at the center. So when we're connected to Christ, we are running on full power. There is no argument there. But it's not the only thing we must be connected with to be fully functional. We want to be functional, not dysfunctional. It's not good to be powered up and dysfunctional. Like your sewing machine. The motor turns on, it has power, but it's not connected to everything. And the thread won't stitch. Or your car won't move, although the engine is purring like a kitten. But you've lost connection with the accelerator pedal. Now then, what do we mean by connection? What does it mean for the church to be connected? What does connection mean for the church? Does it mean we hook people up with uh, an electrical cord and shock the truth in them? Does it mean going door to door, delivering glow tracks? Does it mean preaching the 28 fundamental beliefs, 28 Sabbaths in a row? Does it mean saying happy Sabbath to visitors that cross our thresholds on Sabbath? Does it mean sending uh, greeting cards, inviting people to worship or to tell them that we miss them? Does it mean clicking like on someone's Facebook post? Does it mean calling or texting people to see how they're doing during COVID? Does it mean learning a special handshake when you greet someone? Does it mean learning the lingo when trying to talk to someone? What do we mean by creating connection? After all, it's our goal, it's our objective. Well, a great way to answer this is to go to a powerful story about Jesus and the woman at the well. You've heard the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. You know it well. Jesus is sitting down at about noon, trying to find shade and refresh himself. And he's surely tired from the journey, no doubt thirsty. The disciples are off on errands in town, and along comes a woman, a Samaritan, who needed to get a drink of water from the well. Now, 
Samaritans were despised by the Jews, in case you didn't know. They did not associate with each other. The Jews went out of their way, in fact, to avoid them. So much so, for example, when traveling from Jerusalem to any city in Galilee, for instance, they would go the long way around to avoid Samaritans rather than going the direct and shortest route through Samaria. That's like if we needed to go to Bakersfield but had a problem with the people of Gorman, which sits right on the best and shortest path to Bakersfield on the five. But we hate those people in Gorman, Gorman so much, we rather go the long way to Bakersfield, up the 14, through Palmdale to Mojave, and catch the 58 on to Tehachapi and into Bakersfield. That's how much they hated the Samaritans. But not Jesus. He had to go through Samaria, Scripture reads. He had to go. I believe he had to for several reasons. Of course you know from the story that Jesus ended up ministering to her. So no doubt he needed to minister to her. And that's, of course, a clue. Right at the beginning of the chapter, we get to another clue. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making more disciples and baptizing more than John, although Jesus' disciples were baptizing, not Jesus himself. Therefore, he left Judea and went back to Galilee. So, part of this context in this story is discipleship, the process of making disciples. So with that in mind, we get right back to this story of the experience of this woman and what she had experienced with Jesus. We can see a great deal about Jesus' evangelistic methods, the way he moved, the rhythm he used, his method of making connections and making disciples. In fact, I believe it's no accident that Jesus' interactions with this woman took place at the beginning of his ministry. So let's get back into it. John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. His disciples needed constant training. I want to mention this. This experience happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. At this point in the story, Jesus is alone. Sometimes, and get this, sometimes Jesus ministers to the crowds and sometimes in intimate settings, personal settings. We can learn from this. We can see that there is room to approach situations case by case, not always preaching from the pulpit type evangelism. We can learn a few things from Jesus about making connections with people. This was one-on-one -on -one personal evangelism at its best. So we will see Jesus' methods in this story. And I quote this from Ministry of Healing, page 143. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. So let's look at that, his mingling and desiring good in John 4, 7 through 8. As a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. Now then, she wasn't expecting this at all. She was totally shocked. Jesus sure had a knack with making relationships. Notice verse 9. The Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other, in parentheses. She's waiting for it. The judgment, the condemning looks and the wagging finger to her surprise, and probably at first to her confusion, Jesus shows all the signs that he desires her good. And at the same time, there was a lot of bad in her that, that he could have harshly judged her on with an attitude of rejection. And consider this, not only did the Jews in general avoid contact with the Samaritans, but Jewish men specifically avoided speaking with women in general in public. They even didn't speak to their own wives in public. Now that's extreme, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. And get this, Jewish rabbit, rabbis wanted women to stay in their place. Now I'm using their own words. 
Now, in those days, in that culture, men certainly did not want to discuss theological issues with women either. But women weren't the only group treated that way. That male-dominated society also didn't think the people of the land who worked with their hands, like fishermen and carpenters, had any ability or place to speak about the ins and outs of religion, especially the details of God's plan for salvation. This worldview certainly carried over to their view of women at that time, especially the wives of common laborers. There was a rigid social class system in their day, and this Samaritan woman, in their eyes, was at the very bottom. In the eyes of the rabbis of that day, she would be considered, to use their words, a questionable half-breed Samaritan woman. But Jesus' interaction with her blows away all the stereotypes, prejudices, and racism of the day. For Jesus is not a racist, a bigot, or, or prejudice. He is loving, accepting, and desired her good. He wanted to reach her. He wanted to make a real and deep and authentic, long-lasting connection. He wanted to eventually talk with her about life's most important matters, yet without forcing that conversation on her. So he answers her question by bringing up something intriguing, something to break the ice and inspire a dialogue. Notice this in verse 10. Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. Oh, now this touches her. This is beginning to connect. Never thirst again? That was just the right thing for Jesus to say. And he knew the backstory of that area. She immediately brings up Jacob's well. Notice verse 11 and 12. The woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Are you greater than Jacob? How could your water be better than water from this holy place? As if she's saying, this is a long tradition and a grand heritage. It was their well. It was the land her people inherited. This is what she means. It, it was the land where Jacob wrestled with the Lord and saw a vision of a ladder to heaven with angels descending and ascending. This was the place where Jacob found a deep connection with God. How could your water be any better than our Jacob's well, is what she's saying. Do you see this? See, Jacob found deep connection with God on that very land. Now this woman, lowly in status, in her mind and in society, is going to find the same deep connection with God that Jacob received. This is exciting. This is divine. This is profound. That's what this story is. She's not thinking about a connection with God at this point only literal water. She asked Jesus how his water could be better than Jacob's well. He doesn't even have a bucket. How could he possibly give her something called living water? Notice verses 4, 13 through 15. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But for whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to, to draw water. Now, Jesus had her. He has her full attention. Her heart is pierced. Eternal life? Never thirst? Never need to come work so hard to get a drink? All right, yeah, who, who doesn't want that deal? But Jesus wanted to move the conversation to the very heart of the matter. He needed her to understand the connection that eternal life didn't come from that well or its water, but from Jesus himself, the one who was asking for water and the very creator of water. He needed to move this to a cross connection. You see, cross connections are the most important connections. That's the connection we have with Jesus. And he is moving the conversation and their relationship along a path towards the gospel, the good news. She needed to connect with this story, the story of forgiveness 
acceptance, and eternal life. She needed a connection with Jesus. She needed a cross connection. And she let her guard down. She's comfortable now conversing. So Jesus goes for it, and he gets personal with her. In verse 16, Jesus said to her, Go, get your husband, and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. It's interesting that Jesus said, go get your husband. And this is important to notice. Of course, Jesus knew she didn't have a legal husband. He needed to move her along to a matter of salvation without driving her away with judgmentalism. She gets it. She realizes Jesus knew about her past, yet counted her worthy to be speaking about such noble and important matters with someone considered lowly and undeserving. She senses there's something special about Jesus. She, has a, she realizes that he has superpowers and that he's a prophet. Jesus has now moved her closer to the important matter. See, in this story and in her life, the pressing matter wasn't her dating life. That's not the point. There's a deeper point, a foundational one. And to win her confidence in having authority and with the gift of prophecy, he notes she is right. He notes she has had five husbands living with, with someone who is not her, her own husband. This lets her know that he is truly special, someone to trust, for he knew this about her but wasn't judging her for it. Ah, from Ministry of Healing 143, sound familiar? He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. He won her confidence. She really needs Jesus and his acceptance, his tolerance, his love, and forgiveness. And so by ministering to her needs for water and spiritual water, his approach of non-judgmental acceptance and mingling with her got her to trust him. Do you see that? And something marvelous happens. She came out and asked it. She brings it up. She didn't have to bring it up. And it's this, about her religion and heritage and the way of salvation. Notice verses 19 and 20. The woman said, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. And now she gets to the point that she has on her heart salvation. It's a salvation matter. Verse 20, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. That's it. You see, this is a salvation question. The tradition that the place of worship provides salvation, and should it be in Jerusalem or on Mount Gerizim? You see, that's, it's a salvation question. Jesus did it. He got her attention and led her to the heart of the matter, salvation. Verses 23 and 24. But the time is coming and is here. This is her answer. His answer. When true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, the Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. Jesus responds with, The time is coming where worship won't be limited to this holy mountain or that holy mountain, or this heritage or that heritage. It's through a saving connection with Jesus, through the spirit and truth. Jesus is the truth. Let's get back to the word. Verse 25 and verse 26. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. And Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. You see this. He led her to make this connection. He didn't lead with this. He led her to it. He didn't start out saying, Good day, woman. I'm the Messiah. Get me some water, please. Oh, and by the way, you're worshiping on the wrong mountain. No, he didn't lead that way. He led her through a process by first desiring her good, then helping her with her water situation and her cultural and religious questions. He answered them. He won her confidence. He connected with her. He explained and demonstrated that he's the Messiah, 
and the rest fell into place. Now she's captured. She has this heart-to-heart -heart connection and she can't wait anymore. She, st she stops her work, she puts down her bucket, and she heads for the city to tell all she knows that she has found eternal life through the Messiah. The Messiah has come. Verse 29, come and see a man who has told me everything that I've done. Could this man be the Christ? So a crowd leaves the city to find Jesus. Jesus and the disciples end up staying two days before leaving as he shares with him the gospel, the good news of salvation through him, the Christ. It was so successful through this power of this connection that he made with this Samaritan woman, lifting her up from the abyss of despair and nothingness to now having salvation. Notice verse 39. So many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified, he told me everything I've ever done. See, that's the power of deep connection with each other and with Christ. The power of connection. And it must be why. In Proverbs 18, 24 and Proverbs 27, 10, Solomon shares the importance of good friendship. Notice Proverbs 18, 24. There are persons for companionship, but then there are friends who are more loyal than family. And Proverbs 27, 10. Don't desert your friend or a friend of your family. Don't go to your relative's house when disaster strikes. Better a neighbor nearby than a relative far away. And you know, birth family will always be family. We just grow up always knowing them. Yes, we have a connection, but it's a seamless batch of life events and memories we connect with. For friends, many times we remember that first time we met and became friends. And is, as is often the case, the friendship develops over a common connection, maybe work or school, a special interest, an experience, an encounter that leaves a lasting memory and impression of that first moment, that first encounter. See, these deep connections of friendships are also powerful, like family, but at this, this other level. And so it must be why Jesus was developing a similar one with this woman, this deep connection, so that he could lead her to salvation. And so, as a church, in our path to improvement and strength, to be a 2020 movement, to be able to realize our vision and, and fulfill our mission, we see we need to be able to make cross connections with people, just like Jesus did. We are promoting making connection with each other, member to member, and member to community. And now you see what connection means in this context, in the church context. It means to be able to truly understand one another and meet each other's needs as friends. From there, the foundation is set to bid people to make a cross connection with Jesus. Now, let's review. How did Jesus do this? Well, he mingled. He actually went into the neighborhood. He, he made an effort, every effort. He left the house, so to speak. He participated in the Zoom call. He changed his routine. He went out of his way. Now then, we'll, we will be offering training on, on how to do this. We are exploring ways to go out of our way, not to be judgmental, but to mingle instead, to make connection, to be able to help one another. So stay tuned. Next, remember, he listened. Now sure, we don't have Jesus' masterful eyes that see into private matters, but we have the Holy Spirit who can help us listen to understand people before we open our mouths and put our foot in it. Listening is essential. I remember starting out in ministry way back before seminary. I was a Bible worker for a church and also taught in the youth department. And I remember that first Sabbath that I had to teach the lesson. I started talking without first listening and taking enough time to get to know them. I was trying to illustrate something about peer pressure, and so I said what came right to my mind at that moment. Here it was. You know what Nancy Reagan says, right? They kind of looked around at each other. No one was quick to answer, and no one answered. Awkward silence, blank stares. I waited, and finally I said, she says, 
just say no to drugs. That's her slogan. I couldn't quite understand it, and then that's when I realized when one youth responded, I don't even know who Nancy Reagan is. I knew right away I was not making connection with them yet. I had more work to do. I was trying, but I wasn't there yet. We weren't communicating on the same page yet. So if you know who Nancy is and remember her slogan, you know what I mean here. And on the other side, if you don't know who she is and never heard her slogan, you get it too. If we don't make connection, it's tough to lead people along into a deeper relationship. So just stop for a while and listen, ask questions, and pray. And that leads into Jesus was non-judgmental. He desired her good. He looked for the good, not the bad. And he loved. He helped. And how can we do this? Well, how can we love and not be judgmental and help? We have a special team in place to help guide you in this and hear your ideas about loving others and helping them. We'll be announcing training and more about this in the weeks ahead, but for now, you know, we, we could just follow the steps in this book, The 12 People You Love. It's a great resource to lead you to make cross connections and love and help others and make disciples in a natural way. And Jesus waited for the right moment to tell the story of salvation when she was ready and comfortable. Just be patient. Remember, what Jesus was able to do with this woman in less than a day is remarkable. I mean, he is the Almighty. But for us, we might just have to wait a bit. So just stay connected. Keep connected. Wait. Have patience. It takes time, sometimes years, to build a lasting connection. In fact, in the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships, it's reported that it takes about 40 hours to develop a casual friend and at least 160 hours to make a best friend. So be patient and be ready for the time to use your connection to bid people to follow Jesus through telling your missional story of how Jesus has given you peace and hope and gives it to all who will believe. And what, you know what? It worked for Jesus. It can work for us. She became a follower, telling everyone she knew about salvation through Christ. We, too, can make connections with the community, as Jesus did, and lead people to the cross and to cross connections. So pray for this. Go out of your way to listen to people. Get to know them without judgment. Love them, help them, show them, and tell them your gospel story of how Jesus has become the center of your life. And yes, there is a place for preaching the 28 fundamentals. There is a place for handing out glow tracks. There is a place for liking people's Facebook posts, for texting, for sending cards. It's all part of the patient, loving, non-judgmental approach to building cross connections. So use these methods and the many more we will train you in as part of your plan to develop friendships, to develop connections, Pour your life and your heart into it. God has poured his life into us. It's the least we can do to help, to give back to others. And God has put these people in your life, everyone around you. They are there for a reason, for you to be their cross connector, to lead them to a connection with Jesus. Let's go. Let's get to it. Won't you join me? Let's go. Father in heaven, we ask for a special indwelling of your Holy Spirit as a church, as a community. Help us to connect with one another better and with the community especially. May we be able to be like Jesus in our methods, be patient, kind, loving, non-judgmental, helpful, and not worried about whether they will reciprocate or accept you. Let us just love to love like Jesus loves. Help us, empower us, Keep us connected to Christ in the process and may this gospel story be something near and dear to our hearts to help empower us to make these connections. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.